Hello, and welcome to this presentation on avoiding burnout as a cancer caregiver. Um, we always receive a lot of questions and feedback around um, how to be an effective caregiver, how to take care of yourself. This is an issue that is really important. Um, often a lot of focus is put on the patient, which makes sense, but the caregiver is an integral part to this cancer experience. So the idea behind this presentation is to spend some time really thinking about you as the caregiver and um, how to really be the best caregiver you can be. My name is Carissa Hodgson. I'm a program manager at Gilda's Club Madison. I have been in this role since 2009. And at Gilda's Club, I facilitate some of the support groups um, with adults, teens, and kids. I oversee all of our kid and family programs. I do some of the individual counseling and help to put our program together. Um, I am a licensed clinical social worker and oncology social worker. So I do spend a lot of my time, of course, focusing um, in the cancer realm. I do teach a class at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Graduate Social Work Program on end of life, death and dying and grief. So um, I do have an interest in a lot of the topics that we're going to cover here today. Okay. So the plan for this presentation is first to review um, systems and the layers of cancer and how um, another person's cancer really affects you, you as a caregiver. We're going to spend some time defining who a caregiver is and look at some recent data that helps to inform us about the caregiving role and their unique challenges. We'll talk about stress and how that's different than distress and what exactly burnout is and how those three words work together and really define them. We'll talk about resilience because you can't really talk about caregivers or cancer without talking about the resilience that exists in people who are dealing with these tough challenges. We will look at a caregiver list about the things that um, are most important to help you feel organized and productive, effective, efficient, and then lastly, because it's always integral when talking about care caregivers, we'll talk about self-care. So we'll actually go through a few different practices, uh, most of them mindfulness techniques that are really short, easy, accessible anywhere that you can do anytime to regroup and re-energize yourself. So when a cancer diagnosis is given to someone, it doesn't just affect the patient, it affects the whole family. And you may be very well aware of that, um, but you know nothing in this life really exists in isolation. We are all connected to a system. So these are some different images here uh, that could represent what a system is. So for instance, taking that spider web, um, when there's a cancer diagnosis, it could sort of be like the metaphorical fly that's stuck in the web. And as it struggles, as it's there, it pulls and tugs on every different piece of string that's there of the webbing. So even though there's a cancer diagnosis to a person other than you, you are greatly affected because it's going to pull on you and tug on you, just like it's going to tug on everything in your life, your job, your volunteerism, your role in the community, your finances, it's going to affect everything. So like I just said, um, these are some of the major ones, but relationships, work, whatever that work means, your volunteerism, your schooling, um, your jobs and roles at home, they will all be affected by this cancer diagnosis. So, um, you know, to think like, oh, we will just isolate um, how we deal with this cancer to the patient. It, it really, it's not only is that not effective, it just doesn't make sense. We need to address all of the pieces that cancer touches. Not only do we exist within a system, but we ourselves as people have layers, right? So we often hear about this idea of, um, body, mind, spirit. Um, we have these layers to ourselves that sort of go inwards, as well as I like to envision like this diagram upwards. So whatever our higher power is, if we have a faith, um, religion, maybe it's our existential views, philosophy, our values in life, um, the cancer diagnosis will affect all of those layers of who we are. So it's important to keep that in mind and attend to all of those pieces because they'll, they will all be um, processing the cancer diagnosis differently. 
So just to kind of be a little bit more specific, cancer's effect on the mind. Certainly we spend a lot of time thinking about mental health, um, anxiety, depression, and this is for caregivers as well. Memory effects, sometimes for the patient we talk about um, like a chemo fog or chemo brain, um, we know that stress is a huge part of that. And then there also, of course, is um, an element of how that um, medicine affects body and memory. But for caregivers as well, when you're under a great deal of stress and juggling a lot of balls, our memory is affected. Our cognitive functioning is affected. Our personality can be shifted. Thinking about our spiritual selves, um, cancer can really affect our values and our, our uh, worldview and how we see life. We might start to question, um, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to my family? Um, why, why would a God let this happen? You might start to struggle with hope and hopelessness, um, your faith. Uh, I really see the spiritual realm as being almost the most intimate and important to who we are. Um, because again, those are sort of like our foundational values and why we, why we exist and find meaning in the world. So when cancer starts to pull really strongly in those areas, it seems like we most um, find, we find the greatest distress. Certainly then cancer affects our body, our emotional health, we're extremely fatigued. Caregivers are giving it their all. So they're experiencing a lot of fatigue, which can manifest as body aches, GI disturbances, um, nutrition, activity, exercise, that is all very much affected. Usually caregivers are feeling that they can't do as much and maybe they want to. Patients are dealing with disfigurement and physical changes and physical side effects, but those effects on the body quite significantly affect caregivers as well. So it's important to remember that even though those changes aren't happening to you as a caregiver, um, you can be very intimately affected by the changes of your loved one. I know that for a lot of people and kids in particular, hair loss is big. Um, when kids see their parents, their mom lose her hair, that's really hard. And as an adult partner, you might not think it's gonna bother you as much, but you might be sort of struck by how much it really does affect how you see your partner, your loved one, and how, how like sort of your memory and concept of them. Defining who a caregiver is. Um, here's one quote from a caregiver who says, people talk about a caregiver, but you don't really know what a caregiver is until you're really in that role. I learned that a caregiver wears many hats, listener, observer, protector, planner, anticipator, the backup brain to the patient, the organizer, the strong one, the level-headed one. The caregiver is the go-to person all the time. I quickly realized that I could not do it all and that I needed help. I think an interesting piece about being a caregiver is it is often not a role that you step into by choice. It's not something that you say, I really wanna help someone, so I'm going to be this person's caregiver. When we're talking about a cancer diagnosis, the role, the identity of caregivers often thrust upon people. And it's something that you take on suddenly without notice, there's no planning. And um, some people have a really hard time with that. We are not all natural caregivers. There are some of us who just don't find comfort at all in that role and it can be really difficult to step into. Um, so taking some time to negotiate that, to define what that means for you. Caregivers look very, very, very different. Like I said, some people really thrive in this role and they enjoy taking care of others. They find meaning and purpose in being a caregiver. Other people do it, but they don't like it. And other people resent it. Um, some caregivers, you know, are best at being the emotional support. Others are great at helping to be the sort of level um, cognitive, let me help you make treatment decisions and research. So you'll kind of find your strengths and as any person would, but certainly a caregiver, think about what your strengths, strengths are as a caregiver and play to those and then delegate the other tasks to, to, to other people who can better serve the other roles. So the cancer support community, um, which um, we are an affiliate of, they are an international cancer support community. They do a lot of research, they collect a lot of data. And not only do they have a patient registry that collects data on cancer patients, but they have a caregiver registry. And this data is very new, it just came out this year. And I think it's really important to look at it to see um, how it shapes who a caregiver is and what they need. You'll see that a lot of caregivers are very much a part of providing emotional support. 
Um, they're definitely a key component to going along to medical appointments and helping to make decisions. I think it's incredible that 20% of caregivers spend more than 100 hours a week caregiving. So when you see that um, fatigue listed there as something that caregivers struggle with, that makes a lot of sense. Caregivers are giving a lot of their time, their energy, their emotional health, um, possibly above and beyond a full-time job. So of course, it is exhausting. It is exhausting work. Um, a lot of caregivers feel like they are a part of um, the day-to-day -day sort of caregiver needs and many want more training. That's often something that comes up is caregivers feeling like they don't feel quite prepared, that they would like a little bit more training. Um, to see that two out of three caregivers were quite a bit or very much involved in patients' treatment decisions reinforces that um, we need to see caregivers as part of the team. Oftentimes, you know, the patient is, of course, the identified person, but the medical community should incorporate caregivers as an integral piece of that team, just as well as you as the caregiver should keep in mind you are an important piece of that team. Um, it takes all of you, and often the patient is looking to you to help sort through information and help make the right decisions. Um, so feel empowered in that and take that, take that role seriously. Um, mo mostly 50% uh, of caregivers felt pretty well prepared to respond to emergencies and a lot of them are caring for the physical needs of patients. Um, but a lot of caregivers do not feel prepared to care for the emotional needs that can make sense. There's so many different elements of caregiving, um, caring for the physical pieces, um, reco you know, recovering after surgery, helping to dress wounds, um, you know, getting food, drink, running errands. That's a very separate element of caregiving than sitting there, um, listening, being a part of all of the big conversations and feelings that are going on. Oftentimes caregivers aren't great at both of those things. So again, play to your strengths and then find other people who are good at the other pieces and connect those with the person who needs the support. 68% um, of caregivers did not feel prepared to handle the stress that comes along with caregiving. There's a lot of um, quality of life issues, um, concerns about distress. We're seeing a lot of this and this is why it's so important to pay attention to the needs of caregivers. Almost half reported substantially worse anxiety than the national average. 34% reported substantially worse fatigue than the national average. And 39% said their health was somewhat or much worse than before they began their caregiving role. Three out of four wanted help with understanding the patient's medical condition and treatment. About 50% wanted help managing health benefits and financial services. And about 50% reported at least sometimes experiencing a sense of loss of control over their own life. So these statistics um, tell me that paying attention to the needs of caregivers is vitally important because like the old saying goes, you know, you need to put on the air mask yourself before you put it on your child. That's you as a caregiver. You need to put the air mask on yourself first before you can adequately care for someone going through cancer. If you're not filling up that cup, you're going to have nothing left to pour out. So we need to pay attention to what caregivers need to help them stay healthy and supported. This gets a little bit more specific, looking at what caregivers are experiencing predominantly anxiety. That makes sense. There's a lot of worry, um, fatigue, depression, and then you see that sleep disturbance and pain interference, followed by social function and physical function. When you suss out the top 10 concerns, a lot of them are about the patient. So number one, this makes complete sense to me, caregivers are worrying about the cancer progressing, getting worse or coming back. Yeah, um, worrying about the future. What's going to happen? When your loved one is facing a life altering, life threatening disease, it makes sense that these are the top two concerns. The patient's pain or physical discomfort, being with someone who is in pain, whether it's physical or emotional, is an incredibly difficult thing to sit with. I don't know if you're like me, but to be with someone that is experiencing pain, you wanna fix it, you wanna help, you wanna do whatever you can. So to see that as the number, third, number three concern makes sense to me. Um, caregivers care a lot about the patient's nutrition and exercise habits, um, changes in the patient's mood, but then they're also concerned about their own exercise and being physically active and their own nutrition. Balancing caregiving with other demands, 
the patient's sleep problems, and then the caregiver keeping up with their own healthcare needs. So to sort of define um, the concept of stress and distress, um, just so that we can better work through this, stress responses are normal reactions to life challenges. We need stress in order to, to physiologically focus um, at the task at hand or at the perceived danger. Um, so a little bit of stress is a really good thing. We need that. Sort of like this picture here of a girl riding, learning to ride a bike. She needs to be able to focus on this challenge so that she can figure out how to move her body, what she needs to do to meet her goal to overcome this challenge. Um, but once this amount of stre stress continues to go on long and long, it becomes prolonged and severe, then it becomes an overload. And this is when we start to talk about distress. Um, distress often looks like anxiety, depression. Um, it could be a clinically diagnosable um, anxiety or depression or just similar to that, um, those sort of behaviors. Burnout is a type of distress um, that it's not an official mental health diagnosis, but it's really a state of emotional, physical, and mental health exhaustion um, caused by excessive prolonged stress. So it really is sort of that mind, body, spirit, just it's a drainage um, that I think is very specific to caregiving. So signs of distress, when to pay attention, when to worry. Overall, what I tell people is trust your gut. You know when something is off. Um, it makes sense that in general, things are going to be a little bit more chaotic and stressful when, as a caregiver when, when things first get going and you're trying to figure out treatment options and surgery and everything you're doing. So, so a high level of stress makes sense for a little while. But if things are going on and it's been weeks and you just feel this consistent uh, worrying, this perseverating, you just feel physically awful, you are worrying more than you have anything positive, if you just feel dread, um, it is time to seek help. And it's okay to seek help sooner than later. A lot of people tell me, God, why didn't I seek out some kind of support group or professional help sooner? Um, it's never too soon. It is never too soon to find a therapist, a social worker, um, someone, uh, a clergy in your religious um, institution, someone who can be there to help support you. So pay attention to your own body signals. And if it just feels like you could benefit from someone there to help you, a professional, reach out. There are fantastic distress screens, um, questions that you'll answer that will tell you how at risk for depression or anxiety you are. We do them at Gilda's Club. You can always contact us to complete one. Um, you can possibly do one at um, the Patients Cancer Center. Um, or I know the American Cancer Society has them online as well. But those can be really helpful to help you um, just identify what seems to be your problem areas and then find resources and support in those very specific areas. You are a part of the team, as I've said many times before. So um, you as the caregiver, because you're so important to the patient, you know, you can reach out to um, the nurse, the social worker, um, who is on the team to ask for a referral or how to get help because they care that you are healthy to help the patient. So that's a good place to start. Um, you can always call the cancer support community. They have a 1-800 number um, that's at the end of this presentation. They have professional counselors available that um, help caregivers as well as patients. So that's another good option and they can help point you in the right direction for good local resources, therapists, counselors, support people. The thing about distress is the longer it goes on, the more invasive and the worse it gets. So the sooner you can address it and get support, the better you'll be. So really one of the best pieces of advice you can hear is um, address it as soon as you can. Um, the patient, the, the cancer patient will thank you for taking care of yourself. It is not selfish. It is actually um, one of the best things you can do for the cancer patient and for everyone else in your life because you'll be a a uh, much kinder, uh, much healthier person. So like I said before, you can't really talk about going through a cancer experience without talking about resilience. And um, you might've heard a lot about resilience. Um, Brene Brown does a lot of writing on this and some great books. It's just this idea that you can weather or get through a difficult experience. The old adage of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? Um, so by getting through tough times, 
we, we can get stronger. And actually they found that people's capacity for resilience is uh, much greater than we even think. We're actually built to get through some pretty hard times. So it's more than just getting back to normal. Recovery is, you know, like if something bad happens and you get back to that same point. Resilience is actually going beyond that. You have grown in some way. It's dynamic because it's not just one specific answer, not like do X, Y, and Z, and then therefore you'll get through it in a resilient way. But for some people, it might be that they rely more on humor, while other people it's about their faith and existential thought. For some people, it's finding meaning in or the silver lining in the situation. Other people, it's really about um, uh, flipping the, the challenge on its head and seeing it in a new point of view. So there are so many different ways to be resilient. Um, and that's really tapping into your own strengths. And sometimes it's practicing new ways to be resilient. Like I said, it's more common than you think. People really have this capacity to be very strong human beings. And we might have heard a lot about um, post-traumatic growth. Resilience isn't exactly that. It's similar to, but post-traumatic growth is sort of above and beyond. That is when people experience um, a, very, a huge shift in their life because of getting through a tough experience. And we hear this a lot in connection with cancer, where especially cancer patients will say, I never would have wished cancer in my life. It was awful. And having gone through it, um, I am so much stronger. I, I didn't realize, you know, what was important to me. Going through cancer helped me prioritize the people in my life, my values, what I wanted to do in my life. I switched my career. I realized I wasn't you know, being very fulfilled and facing death. I, I've sort of had a change of mind and now I'm going to spend my life and energy doing something else. Um, you know, I've, I've developed greater skills. I'll, you know, I never was into healthy eating or I was never into yoga or mindfulness and going through cancer, I practiced that. And now it's a really foundational part of who I am. So a lot of us can experience this post-traumatic growth um, and it can happen uh, quick after a challenge or long after. Um, we see these effects of resilience um, all throughout our life. Uh, the literature has many factors of resilience, but it mostly boils down to, to these six. A sense of belonging, so having close relationships, people that you have an intimate connection with, um, also to your community, an ability to express um, and receive empathy, being an authentic person, having a sense of control in your life. Um, so we all maybe have had this experience for ourselves, or maybe we see other people who um, feel like you're a victim, right? Like things keep happening to you. Why does it keep happening to me? All this bad stuff keeps happening. When we think that way, we become a victim and we feel we put ourselves in a place of being out of control. So when we can start to see the places in our life that we do have control, um, it puts us in the driver's seat and it actually helps us to be stronger, more resilient people. Being able to regulate when something knocks us off our feet um, instead of lying on the ground for hours, you know, what helps you to pick yourself up and get it back going again, finding balance in life, being able to solve problems, you know, this flexibility, creativity, uh, a motivation to overcome challenges, that's quite essential. A confidence, so this idea that you can do it, um, you know that you're not great at everything, but you do have strengths, being able to focus on those and figure out how you can rely on those and then get stronger in areas that you're maybe not so strong in. How can that help you to get through life's challenges? Taking responsibility um, where, where it needs to be taken. Having insight, being able to see the bigger picture, like pull out of the immediate acute challenge, see the bigger picture, reframe it. How do you um, see the silver lining? And then perseverance, this realistic optimism. So not a Pollyanna-ish, like everything's gonna be fine, it's good, it's okay. But truly seeing like, you know, this is really hard, like recognizing how things can be really difficult and then saying, you know, I, I know it's hard right now and I've gotten through hard times before. I think we can get through this. I have hope. Being able to make meaning out of a terrible situation. And again, that belief in something bigger it does not need to be tied to any type of faith or religion, but just a concept of something that is always there, bigger than you, um, that will exist through eternity, that will sort of take care of you. Humor is possibly not an official 
factor of resilience, but I think we all have seen how important it is in our life to get through hard times. Um, an optimism with a realistic look at the tragic. Man, does a good laugh, you know, it can just, even in the most tense of situation, if it's an authentic laugh, it can just resolve tension and kind of reset everyone. So whether it's for the patient that you're doing it or for yourself as a caregiver, um, seek out some laughter. It really does have some incredible biological shifts in your body. Laughter yoga, it can be super silly and uncomfortable, but there are great benefits. Um, I know there are even like laughter hotlines and you can Google laughter yoga, have a good laugh, or maybe it's just having a good laugh with a friend. Um, but anything that gets you to see the humor in a hard situation um, can help to get through it. So on to this caregiver checklist, because checklists and caregivers go hand in hand. You always have to have that pen and paper ready to go. Since caregivers are such an essential piece of the care team, um, you need to empower yourself to, to feel educated, feel educated enough to sift through um, treatment decisions and options, think critically, talk with the patient, um, bring your own data and research if that's what you guys are into, but there are so many reputable great sources of information um, that you can find out there. So however you like to research and gather information, do that so that you again can feel like uh, you are confident in the information you have and the decisions that you make. Communication is a foundational stone of, of any relationship. And when you are going through something difficult like cancer, you really need to um, do the best you can to communicate um, with each other, with other people, with your medical team. It really does come down to communication skills. Know your audience. So the way you speak to the oncologist might be different than you speak to the nurse. That might be different than you speak to your best friend, then how you speak to your cousins and relatives, they're all going to get sort of different information and you recognize that they have a particular interest. Um, so, you know, if you are at your doctor's office and you spend a great deal of time talking about, oh gosh, um, just, you know, your, uh, how you really need to get your affairs in order. Um, that's probably time better spent finding um, a lawyer, an attorney to help you with that, right? Um, you, you know that your friends and family are all different people. You have some friends who do really great at listening to whatever you need to say. You can vent, you can cry, you can have big feelings, and they will just be there and listen and support you. Um, you have other friends who they cannot handle emotion. If you shed a tear, they freak out. So think about who you're going to for support. So go to those emotional people when you need emotional support. Go to those friends who are great with research and data um, and finding out information, go to them when you need that kind of information. Um, it's more efficient, it's more helpful. And for you as the caregiver, it's just um, a better use of your time and energy because as we've seen throughout all of these slides, your time and your energy is limited. You need to save it for yourself and for the patient. Timing can make a big difference. And though we can't always um, change when we talk to people about um, important information, if, if we can, um, to kind of decide when we tell people big things, it may help. So uh, like talking to kids, for instance, um, like right before bedtime, letting them know um, a big treatment decision or an update in mom or dad's cancer, or grandma and grandpa's cancer, that's probably not the best time because they're trying to go to sleep, right? We don't want to like up their anxiety. Same thing if you, um, you know, as the caregiver, you're really needing some extra support and you've got a couple of really great friends. One of them is in the middle of a really big work project and they're really stressed out. And you have another friend who's retired, probably going to the retired friend makes more sense. They might have more time and energy for you. So, you know, recognizing that we all are human and we all have our triggers and our limits. Um, and if we can catch people at the right time, we might get a better response. Trying to practice being clear and concise. I'd also say being direct. As the caregiver, you're probably the gatekeeper for the patient, um, which might be a really important role because the patient also has limited time and energy and they're having to focus on themselves. So um, being able to um, tell people in your support world exactly what you need and by when and how to do it, um, using your time efficiently, 
Um, the clear and concise comes into to play, especially when you have important doctor's appointments. Um, they have limited time. We know that. So being able to go in prepared with a list of questions, um, it's extremely helpful, not only for yourself, because it makes you feel organized, but also for your medical team. You can get through more information um, without having to kind of sift through the, the other chit chat. Paying attention to what is not being said. As a caregiver, you know, you're probably paying a lot of attention to the patient and their nonverbals, um, but also the people who are supporting you. Um, pay attention to your own nonverbals. So as a caregiver, you often will probably, you'll, you'll have times that you probably aren't the, the nicest to the patient, right? <laughs> because we're human and we have our own stresses and we get frustrated. Um, and so honesty is a good, is a good policy. So if you're having a bad day and you're irritated and the patient's asking you for something and your voice says, I'll do it, but your tone says you're not happy about it, that might be hard for the patient to hear. And they might say, well, are you angry with me? But sometimes it's best just to be honest with, with them and say, I'm having a hard day. You're right. My tone is not great. I'm, I'm really upset. I do want to help you, but yes, I'm, I'm having a hard time. So your nonverbals, uh, your body language, your tone of voice will speak volume. Listen with your eyes, ears, and heart. So this idea of empathy. Um, I think you probably have been in experiences where people are listening, but they're not, and you can tell they're just not in the conversation. It makes a huge difference. And um, you want to show up and be empathic with the patient just as you want others to show up empathically for you. Validate feelings, reflect them. Just like I said earlier, be honest with how you're feeling. All of this um, is going to go far in getting through these really tough times, being able to just communicate with one another. We're not gonna do it perfectly, no one does. We all make mistakes, but being able to take responsibility for when you mess up and when you say terrible things, um, that's really important to just take ownership and then move on, let it go and move on. Psychologist Susan Still came up with this idea of ring theory, which um, is really fantastic. It almost seems kind of like a really obvious way of interacting with others, but to see it laid out in a diagram makes a lot of sense and I think is helpful as you're working with your support team and with the patient. So as you'll see, in the very middle of this diagram is the person going through a tough time. So that could be any tough time, someone dealing with losing a job, going through a divorce, um, being homeless, but in this scenario, it's the patient, the person with a cancer diagnosis. And then each circle moving out is um, sort of the, the relationships um, moving from most intimate to less intimate. Um, the people in the closest like inner circle moving out. As you can see here, the idea is comfort in, dump out. What that means is going in, into the circle, getting closer to this, into the center, you want to be giving positive, loving, kind energy. Any venting, frustrations, um, seeking out help, you want to move to a circle outside of the circle. So what that means is, you know, the caregiver probably should not be going to the patient with all of their problems. You know, if the patient is in the midst of treatment and they're experiencing terrible side effects and their caregiver comes home and is like, let me tell you about my bad day. My boss did this and then you'll never guess what my colleague did. And then blah, 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 blah. Now for you and your unique situation, that might be perfectly normal. So maybe that's not, that might not be bad. But in some instances, that might not be the best because that might be hard for the patient to hear because they just have no energy um, or focus to think about your problem or someone else's problem. But it's also not good for you as a caregiver because you're probably not going to get what you're looking for. So to get the best support, you go to someone outside of your circle. So if we're looking at that same scenario with a hard work day, calling up a friend, a relative, um, a neighbor, someone that you kind of chit chat with, that is where you want to vent and dump out. So think about that in your own life, in your own circle right now, and maybe even take the time to draw this out and think about, okay, who are my people um, on the inner circle and then moving outward? Who are my people that I would dump out to? Maybe even like list them out so that the next time you're having a really hard day and you don't even have 
the brain width to think about who to contact, you can go to that list and say, okay, it looks like first on my list for dump out is my brother and then call him up um, because it's important that we all know who we can go to for support. Connection in general is essential. Um, as humans, we are communal animals. Research continues to show how important it is to connect with other people, especially when we're going through tough times. Um, that not only means outward, because that is important to connect with other people, but also inward with all of the layers of ourself, like we talked about, mind, body, spirit, all those different layers, and also upward. So back to that sort of um, uh, higher power, uh, value-driven part of you, being able to find meaning in life and connect with something bigger, um, something purposeful, is what gets us through the toughest of times. So again, think about who in your life it is that you want to connect with. Maybe list them out. There are always great activities that you can do. You don't even need any professional to walk you through it. But just make lists of who is it in my world that I want to connect with that, that, um, that fulfills me, that gives me meaning and hope and uh, you know, fills my cup when it feels empty. Take time to really think about that so that when you're needing time, you can go to those people and go to those activities, whatever it is that fills your cup. You cannot do this alone. Um, it is almost impossible to be a lone caregiver. Um, you can do it, people do it, but it is really rough. So if you do have people in your life that you can collaborate with, please do it. Um, the first thing is prioritize. You're facing a cancer diagnosis, you and probably the patient, you're gonna take time, whether it's um, intentionally or subconsciously, you're gonna start prioritizing what is going to take your time and energy because it's limited. The other stuff is gonna sort of float to the bottom. Organize, organize your days, organize your you know, medical schedule, organize um, how your family's gonna get through this, um, organize medications. Organization is a really key skill. Um, if you can, if, if hopefully you're, if you're a great organizer to begin with, that's great. And if not, maybe find someone in your life who can help you to organize because it will make you and the patient's life a lot better. Building that team, I keep coming back to it. Um, if you can have a cancer support team to get through this, it'll make everyone's life a lot easier. So identify who your key assets are, maybe even name team leaders, going back to people's strengths, right? So who's sort of going to be in charge of your, um, oh, maybe your communication team that's going to keep people updated. Maybe you're going to have sort of like a, a care package team that's going to make sure that the patient is getting cards of love and a little letters and care packages. If you have your research team, people's looking at data and information on clinical trials and second opinions. Um, you might have your food team, people who are gonna bring you food or people who are gonna get the kids to their activities, take the dog for a walk. Um, being able to put that support team together and giving people jobs, that not only helps you, but I can guarantee that if you, know, if you have loved ones in your life that say they wanna help, they truly do want a job. And a lot of people are thankful when you give them a very specific job to say, please, your job is to, you know, take my wife to treatment on Thursdays. Like, you know, you said you were retired and you have all this time. Do you think you could do that? Because I need to go to work. More than um, likely that person will say, yes, I really appreciate that you asked me. I'd be happy to do that. So, you know, keep in mind that people do like to be asked. A lot of times in your life, you have people saying, just let me know how I can help. And people usually are very, it's well-intentioned. People do mean that. But as a caregiver and as a patient, that's overwhelming at times because you don't even know like what it is that they can do to help. So if you can be very clear, concise, specific about how they can help, that will help everything run a lot more efficiently. Delegate, delegate, delegate. And there are some great resources out there. There are website and apps that can help to organize your team. Um, My Lifeline through Cancer Support Community, Caring Bridge, there's a Meal Train Plus to help with meals. Technology can be your friend. There's a really great place for technology in all of this. You can't really get through this list without talking about feelings. You do have to feel the feels because the more you ignore it, the bigger they get. Um, and they will just always be there until you deal with them. And you cannot get through something like cancer without feeling really big feelings. You know how they have those big charts with all the different feeling faces on it? I think those can be great for emotional vocabulary and getting very specific. 
I also can find them really overwhelming. And um, I had a mentor once who really just boiled all the feelings down to these four main feelings. And why that's helpful is then it gives us direction as to what to do with it. So fear, which is just sort of the most basic response as humans we have. Um, fear is telling us, what do you need to pay attention to? And remember, fear is a collection of, you know, worry, trepidation, stress. There are lots of different words that, again, if you really boil it down, you can realize, no, at the bottom of this is fear, anger. What is it that you're fighting for? What is it that you want? Identifying that can be so helpful. You leave a doctor's appointment, you're spinning, you're fuming, you're really upset. And initially you just recognize you're just mad and you're not, you're not even sure why. You're like, oh, why is it that I'm leaving this appointment feeling so upset? If you give that anger a little space and you really think about it, it might require you talking it out with a friend or it might, if you're a writer, you like to journal. If you just spend a little time kind of trying to figure out what's at the bottom of my anger, you might realize, oh, what is it? So what is it I'm, I'm fighting for? Oh, I, I'm fighting to be heard. I felt like the doctor did not hear us today. He did not hear me and my wife say that what we care most about is quality of life. And the doctor just kept telling us about all these new medicines and they're all really hard and they might make you know quality of life really terrible. And no matter what we said, I just felt like the doctor didn't hear me. Well, once you figure that out, then you can better have a response and go back to the medical team and say, I felt like you maybe weren't hearing that what's important to us, what's most important is quality of life. That might open up a whole new conversation um, because you were able to get more specific about what that feeling was. Sadness, that's telling us that there's something we need to let go of. There is a loss of some kind. Usually you just need to, to feel it and to find a way to let go of what it is. You fought for something, you lost, you didn't get it. Now you're sad. Joy, that's an easy one. You just, you celebrate the heck out of it. When you're joyful, enjoy it. Um, like I said, many different ways to feel the feels. Remember that we um, process emotion um, and feelings and thoughts visually, auditorily, so through hearing and words, and also kinesthetically, which means like movement and, and feeling. So you might be a person that um, really likes music, you're more auditory. It might be that you're a dancer, exerciser, and when you're um, stressed out, you like to go for a run. It might be visual, you might be very artistic, you like to paint. So play to the type of coping skills that, you, that are, work well for you, that have worked well in the past, and just work with your emotions, normalize it, accept it, let it go, move on. You also can't talk about cancer and caregiving without talking about grief. Grief is an absolutely normal and healthy way of responding to a loss. And a lot of people think that grief is just synonymous with death, and that is not true at all. Grief is about loss, and there are many different losses in dealing with a cancer diagnosis. A loss of security, um, a loss of trust and safety. It might be more um, tangible losses like a job, loss in a job, um, loss in a certain role that you had, you had to give something up because of the cancer. So to be able to um, identify all of those layers of losses will help you to feel the sadness really that accompanies that and let it go. When you factor in the pandemic, you have even more layers of loss, all of the losses of people you can't see, you can't connect with your um, most important essential people, your care team, your friends, family, relatives, you can't go to gatherings, you might not be able to go to your spiritual center to an important volunteer gig. Um, my goodness, a loss of money, finances, it, you, the list goes on. There's so many losses intertwined in this exact time and moment. So what you do with grief is you feel it and you let it go. And there are great rituals to assist in it um, that you can Google. You might wanna seek out the help of a therapist, a grief therapist, um, but it's just stuff you can do at home. Um, you know, there's some great ones like um, uh, a write and burn where you can write down or draw pictures of things that you have lost and then light a fire outside. Or if you can't go outside, maybe have in a safe way and so in a safe way inside, you know, burn these things and just feel sort of it disappear and let go. Um, it might be again that you're just a writer and you like to write and journal and you need to sort of process through that way. Or um, again, through art, through song, through some kind of creative expression. 
But the biggest piece is really acknowledging the loss. And usually when people at least identify what it is that they're grieving, what that loss is, it allows them to just let it go. Caregivers probably get incredibly sick of hearing this, but it's because it's so vital. You have to take care of yourself. Um, you just, you can't do anything unless you have something to give, right? So we saw earlier in that data that exercise and nutrition is often an area that is neglected, but we know that the nutrients we put in our body has a direct effect on how we feel. If we put junk in, we have junk out. Uh, moving activity, physical activity, if we're not moving, if we're completely sedentary, laying around, um, we're gonna feel like crap. And it's going to really, you know, it's gonna worsen any kind of depression. Actually, you know, fatigue, it's gonna make fatigue worse. Sometimes people think like, I'm just so exhausted, I just need to lie down. Well, there's of course some truth in that, that you're, of course your body needs to rest. It needs good sleep is what it needs. Um, but sometimes the best thing you can do for fatigue is a walk and fresh air. My goodness, especially right now when we're all cooped up um, inside, get out, go for a walk outside. And it doesn't have to be a big bang. You don't have to do a cardio session. Um, just move, even if it's moving around your house, go up and down stairs a couple of times, but your body will really thank you for moving it and paying attention to it. Like I said before, listen to your emotions, give that part of you space, engage in something creative purposeful, that will feed that spiritual part of you, that element of um, values and, and deeper meaning. Practice any kind of element of mindfulness that works for you. The research continues to show how valuable this is. And um, as our intern pointed out to me this morning when I was going through this with her, she said, God, looking at that data from caregivers, you can see that what caregivers are most concerned about, it's all very future oriented. They're all worried about the future and what lies ahead. And gosh, that must be why mindfulness is so important to them because it helps bring them back to the current moment. And I said, exactly, what a great point. I'm gonna make sure I say that when I record the presentation. Um, it really does help orient you to the right now. And when our mind and body and spirit is just in the present moment, it's not future tripping and worrying about the future and it's not holding on to regrets and resentments from the past, it is just here. Um, there's so many different ways to practice mindfulness and you might have your own ways that work great for you. Um, perhaps you've never tried anything before. If you have access to technology, which you probably do if you're listening to this, you know, just Googling guided imageries, yoga, um, mantras, grounding exercises. I mean, you can find so many great things online. So again, use technology to your advantage to get engaged in something that will help you practice mindfulness. Just to kind of walk through um, some of these that, again, what I like about these practices, they can be done anywhere, anytime. And a lot of the time people don't even know you're doing it. So breathing, you hear that all the time, like just breathe, take a deep breath. Um, that's not just an annoying thing people say to you to calm you down. It's, there's a physiological reason that when we take big breaths, it um, cues our body to start calming down. So it starts to slow our heart rate down um, and just calm the body, bring down the blood pressure. So even taking three deep breaths and focusing just as much on the exhale as the inhale, because we want to squeeze out all the stale carbon dioxide to make room for the fresh, fresh oxygen. So taking a moment to breathe. I have a picture of a hand here because I use the hand in a couple of these. It can be a nice um, visual to practice this. So there's five finger breathing where you can trace the hand. And it just, again, it gives you something to do and focus on while you're breathing. So as you trace up, like along your pinky, you breathe in, you pause at the top, and then you come down the pinky and breathe out and pause. And then you can go up the finger, breathe in, pause, and down the finger and breathe out. And you just do that by tracing your hand. And it might just be that you just trace one hand and that's all you needed. But you probably will feel at least 50% better after tracing that one hand by focusing on breathing. There's something called square breathing. Again, that sometimes people do better when they have a visual or something they can kind of think about. Um, and square breathing is really just breathing in, two, three, four, hold, 
two, three, four. Out, two, three, four. Rest, two, three, four. So that's four parts that make a square and they're all equal, hence the square. So you can even visualize or trace a square as you go in, out, and you hold all of those. Grounding, that's a word you might've heard and you might think, what the heck are you even talking about? Um, it's kind of one of those like woo-woo words, but truly what it means is to orient yourself to the present time and place. Because like I said, we're often in dealing with cancer, we're worrying about the future, we're worrying about this, we're worrying what's next on our to-do list, like what's next, go, 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 worry, worry, worry. Bringing our body, mind, and spirit back to the present moment is very effective. Especially people sometimes have the experience as if you're floating, you feel totally untethered in life and like you're just kind of floating. And that would be a good time to ground yourself as you can kind of see the metaphor there, the analogy of bringing yourself back down to the ground so you're not floating away. You can do this by kind of like putting your feet on the ground and lightly stomping or tapping your feet, wiggling your toes. That can physically remind your body like you are here, you're in the ground. Sometimes people visualize roots going down into the ground to hold them like safe and tight to the ground um, or people imagine energy. Something you can do using your five senses, this is where that hand, the five comes in again, is um, use that hand if you're feeling kind of untethered. Take a minute to go, okay, what is one thing I hear right now? What is one thing I see right now? What is one thing I feel right now? Smell right now? Taste right now? And that gets your mind focused on right here and now and what you're experiencing right around your body can be really helpful and great. And again, but right now, both the breathing and the grounding are activities you can do anywhere, anytime. You can do it in the doctor's office before a big appointment. Um, you can help the patient. You can help lead them through these activities. We know how important this is as the person going through cancer. Muscle relaxation and guided imagery, fantastic. Um, our bodies get really tense. You might experience that you've had sort of chronic neck pain, shoulder pain, back pain, especially Going, when you are going through times of stress, it's because we tense different muscles in our bodies. So muscle relaxation is taking time to do a body scan. Um, you might wanna first purposely tense, tense your body. So some of them, um, if you sort of close your eyes right now, and then I say, I want you to squeeze every muscle in your body right now from your toes, to your ankles, to your calves, to your thighs, to your buttocks, to your hips, your abdomen, your chest, your shoulders, your arms, scrunch up your shoulders, squeeze your face, scrunch your face, and just hold it as tight as you can and squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. And relax and let go of the tension. And now take a minute to scan your body and notice any lingering areas of tenseness, tightness, discomfort, and just imagine on your next inhale, breathing into that spot and letting it relax and breathe out the tension with your out breath. And continue to do this body scan for as long as you need to relax all of those areas. You might even imagine a magic ball of light, it might be a warm light or cool, depending on what your body needs. You imagine this ball that's rolling up your body, relaxing and soothing every muscle as you imagine it going up, up, up your body. So that kind of muscle relaxation can really help with that chronic tension. Incredible guided imageries that you can find online, uh, free ones, if you just Google it, you know, YouTube, wonderful, wonderful guided imageries and you can get them specific to what you're looking for. So we saw that sleep disturbance was a primary concern. You can find guided imagery to sleep. I've had so many members at Gilda's, Gilda's Club say how participating in our relaxation guided imagery classes has significantly improved their sleep. So whether it's um, attending our guided imagery at Gilda's Club or doing it online, um, going to the library to get CDs or videos, try practicing some of those to see how that can help you to just calm and relax. Mantras are sayings that also help to reorient ourselves. So especially if you're um, 
struggling with something, like if you're only seeing the negative lately and you're having a really hard time staying positive and you don't like that sort of superficial, like stay positive, but you truly want something meaningful, maybe just develop, uh, you develop a line in your uh, mind that you say to yourself. So maybe it's like, um, see the good. Like when all you see, like you feel like all you're seeing is the ugly, like, okay, see the good, see the good. So every time you feel triggered, every time you feel that little telltale hook of trying to get you to just be negative, you just repeat this to yourself. Or maybe it's something like, let it go. You know, I'm not going to bite the hook of this negativity. I've got enough to deal with. So I'm not going to allow the petty drama in my life to hook me into that. I'm just not. Let it go. Move past it. It might be a favorite line of poetry um, or a line from a movie. It could be silly even. Maybe you're using that humor and you just have a ridiculously funny line from a movie that makes you laugh every time you think of it. And you just repeat it to yourself, you know, um, anything that can just help your mind to shift its focus because our minds are kind of like Velcro and they will get attached to whatever's right there. And if we help it get, become uh, more like uh, cellophane, like saran wrap and things just kind of glide right past it. And we can instead choose where we focus our mind's energy. Um, right now it's, you know, it's hard to get, you can't really make appointments. There aren't really many people doing um, in-person appointments because of COVID. Um, but when the virus isn't around, energy work people find um, can be really helpful as a caregiver to help you to de-stress and re-energize yourself. So things like healing touch or Reiki, um, the EFT technique, tapping, acupressure, reflexology. Some of these things you can even look up online and they might lead you to um, through little tutorials. Um, but these are some great resources for self-care. So hopefully you can practice at least one of them, maybe even make a goal with yourself and say, this week I will, and you can start super simple. This week I will practice five finger breathing at least once. Start there. And then maybe you move up and say, you know, next week I'm going to breathe mindfully at least once a day. Maybe you move up to, I'm going to practice yoga a couple of times this week. I mean, set little goals and make them realistic. You know, keep in mind that you have a lot in your plate. So if you set yourself up to failure, you might feel worse. So make them realistic, attainable goals and maybe keep yourself accountable and let people in your life know that it's important to you to practice this. And then they can check in with you and say, hey, I know that you said you really wanted to uh, do more of that guided imagery. How's that going? And that can help you to keep accountable to your goal. The Cancer Support Community is a fantastic resource. If you have not been to their website, I really highly suggest that you do. They have tons of resources specific to caregiving. Um, they have great pamphlets to read through. They have videos, they have a blog, they have a radio show, um, great stuff. And like I said, they also have that 1-800 um, call-in number that you can access through that website. And at any time, if you wanna follow up with me um, regarding something about this presentation, um, or how to be a good caregiver when going through cancer, or if you're just trying to get connected to resources at Gildas Club Madison, please do not hesitate to reach out. All right, um, remember to keep breathing, take good care of yourself, and be well.